Was 2018 the aberration or was 2019 the aberration with the ascension of Syracuse football under Dino Babers? We got uh, John Casillo on the line from Noon's Magician, SB Nation's platform for Syracuse Athletics. Please join him and the rest of the staff there talking orange every day. Uh, we get John on from time to time to talk up Syracuse football and get a bit of a roster breakdown as we carve through the teams in the Power Five for 2020. All right, John. Tommy DeVito, of course, he's the name everyone's going to gravitate to first and foremost. And he got beat up last year, but still threw 19 touchdowns and five picks. Are you pleased with his development? Considering, again, 50 sacks is quite a, a number to endure over the course of a season. I mean, rough offensive line situation last year. It was rectified by the last, you know, kind of quarter of the season. Uh, however, at that point, Tommy was already pretty banged up. So for me, I, I think that. Tommy did reasonably well by the numbers, um, all things considered. And I think if we see the offensive line look more like it did over the final three games last season, you'll see a much better Tommy DeVito, a much more, you know, kind of focused and confident Tommy DeVito. I think one of his bigger issues last year, uh, while he was really good on deep balls, but because he was under pressure so much, he didn't really go through his progressions. Uh, he locked in on targets here and there. Young quarterbacks will do that. He's still got great mechanics and he still throws a really nice deep ball. So I think you'll see him probably utilize screens more. You'll see him do a better job of going through progressions, and hopefully, you know, he still he'll still emphasize, um, you know, the the deeper downfield passes since we still have the the receivers to be able to catch those pretty easily. And with no spring ball, uh, and, and then uh, the conditions being what they are going into fall camp, and we've seen a proposal by the NCAA that should be unveiled here in the next week and voted on. We we don't expect necessarily any threat to his job by anyone. No. No, not at this point. I think, you know, Tommy came in as a four star, like top 300 guy. And uh, nobody that's come in since um, has really looked that part. But, you know, obviously injuries happen, things like that. You never know. So, next man up. And I, I, I hope, uh, if God forbid, he needs to be replaced, that, uh, that, that somebody's ready to go. So, four offensive linemen back. You, you mentioned the ills across the offensive line, but that they were fixed to a certain extent near the end of the season. So, do you feel more confident about this unit coming back? I, I think, you know, you, you look at what happened over the last three games where Aaron Service was uh, shot out to left tackle, uh, Carlos Vettorello was moving to the center position, and uh, Matthew Bergeron was put into right tackle, and things went considerably better, uh, both in terms of, you know, protecting whoever was a quarterback, uh, both Tommy DeVito and Clay Clayton Welch, and also just running the ball. Uh, Mo Neal did a fantastic job uh, moving the ball on the ground over the final three games of the season last year. So I think... As long as we see something similar to that, I think you'll see um, a decent group. I know, uh, you know, David Hale over at ESPN uh, had them ranked as the fourth best uh, returning ACC offensive line. That's pretty high on them. I'd say maybe optimistic. I'd still put them probably in the top half, which is a hell of a lot better than, you know, what we saw for much of last season. Yeah, if you get the fourth best offensive line play in the ACC, I, I think that, that you would take that right now. Uh, for this fall, you mentioned Mo Neal, 846 yards, five per pop on the ground with seven touchdowns and 29 catches out of the backfield. So he's gone. And uh, you bring back, though, some production uh, starting with Abdul Adams and what uh, Jarvian Howard. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see what exactly this uh, the Syracuse running back group looks like. Obviously, you know, Adams is an Oklahoma transfer and in Oklahoma. He really did really looked pretty impressive, but obviously, you know, we're not going to have Oklahoma's line or the offensive system that necessarily produces um, at the same level. That said, like between him and Howard, who's a bit of a power back, um, could be a nice combo. And then you add in uh, Jawar Jordan, uh, who is a freshman who played in a few games last year, uh, arguably the fastest man on the roster, had a 15 carries for 105 yards last year. So definitely someone to watch. Um, I actually see him kind of splitting time between running back maybe a slot receiver role, uh, just because I think Dino Babers and a new offensive coordinator, Sterling Gilbert, are going to use everything they possibly can to get him on the field. And we know, John, of course, uh, in addition to quality at wide receiver that everybody wants, you need a little bit more depth than most teams because of the sets that you run. You got Tristan Jackson, who's gone off to the NFL, and I'd see that uh, three of the top four pass catchers on the team gone. It's a little disconcerting, but you know what? Uh, especially with Dino, like we've been able to plug in new receivers pretty much every year. Uh, you know, from guys like Amba Atawo and Steve Ishmael, uh, Jamal Custis, uh, last year Tristan Jackson. 
guys who've been able to kind of come out of nowhere to, to really put up some big numbers in this system. And I think it's going to happen again this year. Uh, the name to watch is probably Taj Harris. Uh, first couple seasons, he's been able to, to catch, you know, 40 balls a year for the most part. I think him and Tommy DeVito will be in much better rhythm this season. And he's someone who can both like function really well with mid range routes and also, uh, you know, catch deep balls. So I think you'll see some bigger numbers from him. Uh, Richard freshman, uh, Courtney Jackson is another guy who I think you're going to see some bigger numbers from. And then, uh, Nikeem Johnson, who kind of, uh, didn't look great, uh, last season, but in 2018, um, he caught over 30 passes. So I think, I think we still have the pieces in there, uh, to help DeVito out. And then Aaron Hackett at tight end has become a pretty dangerous target in the red zone. Yeah, six touchdowns out of 23 catches for Hackett. So that speaks to red zone efficiency, obviously, and him being a target uh, in converting touchdowns. All right, John Casillo on the line from Noon's Magician talking Syracuse uh, roster breakdown here for 2020. And we're trying to carve through as many teams as we can get to in the Power Five here. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So please lock it in. Uh, like the videos, that helps out the channel. Uh, make your comments below. So whatever you think uh, concerning Syracuse football, your prediction on where the Orange will finish in the ACC, obviously coming off five and seven and two and six in conference, but going back a year to 10 and three and a top 15 finish. What does uh, Dino Babers have in store for us this year? Leave your comments below. And now we'll talk defense, John. So uh, in just my conversations with you, and then as you can imagine, watching more Syracuse football in 2018, than I did in the few years before that and in 2019 because they were playing bigger ball games. Uh, it, it seems as though, um, you know, we had conversations for years about the lack of quality defensive line play and that that needed to get better. And then, boom, it looked like maybe there was a cycle there because of uh, recruiting, but also upperclassmen, and it all just kind of came together there in 2018 in regards to defensive line play, uh, specifically a pass rush with 43 sacks, and then a bit of a, a downturn last year, and you lose 21 of 30 sacks from last season. Yeah, I think last year, you know, it was a combination of maybe a little bit of over-pursuit, also like some struggles at linebacker, and I think hopefully this year the linebacker issues have been taken care of what we do need to do is figure out a way to replace the sacks that uh, Kendall Coleman and Alton Robinson provide. And like a guy like Alton Robinson, like while the numbers look like they dipped a bit um, as a senior, if you look at, you know, how much he was doubled, how many tackles for loss he was still able to pick up, like he was just a great player. And I think he's going to do really well at the NFL level. Um, but there's still options, you know, on the roster. McKinley Williams didn't play for most of the season and he was kind of our top uh, run stuffer last year. And he only played the last couple games. Uh, Kingsley Jonathan is a senior and he's been getting spot work kind of backing up Coleman and Robinson for the last few years. And then Josh Black's another guy who actually came in when Coleman did, but I was able to get a red shirt year in there. Um, he's someone who's played both inside and out. So while we don't necessarily have the experience on paper, um, there's actually a decent amount of it there. Uh, where things get interesting though, is, you know, beyond them, you don't really have a ton on the line. Um, and that's where, you know, a guy maybe like Tyrell Richards, who's played both like defensive end and linebacker um, could end up getting, you know, some work here and there. John Casillo on the line, breaking down Syracuse's roster, Andre Cisco, 12 career interceptions leads a secondary that, that looks pretty well stacked. Yeah. I mean, really the only question is the strong safety. Uh, Cisco obviously is a potential all American candidate and a guy who could be a first round pick next year. Um, if he decides to go early, he's been one of the best ball Hawks in the country. Uh, Trill Williams has Played a bunch, um, but not started a lot. I think we'll see a lot more from him. As he's now probably going to be the starting cornerback. I mean, Afita Melifanwu uh, is someone who really was a great cover corner last year, and he got injured for a stretch, and that hurt us kind of midseason. But I, I feel like with those three guys, like you, you can make up for maybe some inexperience um, you know, at the other safety spot. All right, John, Dino Babers, what does the fan base think at this point? What's the evaluation? Because it's kind of fascinating to think, okay, first of all, to listen to the man, you've got to respect him. Uh, so he's a likable guy in regards to, okay, this guy's, uh, likable, but also not uh, a pushover. He's a, he's a firm guy. He's a leader of men, uh, from all indications that I get, uh, any family would want to send, um, th their young, uh, student athlete to go play for Dino Babers. Uh, on the other hand, you know, he pulls off the two big wins against Virginia Tech and Clemson during the four win season. So you see that 
that burst of hope. And uh, I think that's even more significant than many would think because there aren't four and eight teams across the country pulling off those kind of wins. Then they break through with 10 and three. And maybe most impressive among the 10 and three was going to Clemson and taking them down to the wire and within a fourth down stop of uh, pulling off a major, major upset. And then back down to two and six in the conference and five wins last year. I think a lot of fans are, I know I like talk about it on the site a bit. Um, when Dino got there, he kind of talked about, you know, having belief without evidence. So asking fans to buy in before you saw the results. Um, now I think, you know, fans have kind of transitioned to, well, I have evidence, but not necessarily all the belief anymore a after last season. I actually think like considering the injuries we had, considering the offensive line struggles, uh, I think maybe there was some reading your own headlines a little too much in the off season, but realistically five and seven's not, not acceptable, but it's also not cratering out. And I think Dino under seemed to understand in the off season that he couldn't just rest on what was working before made some changes, replaced both the offensive and defensive coordinators. So I think a lot of fans at least are satisfied that he saw changes that need to be made and didn't just stick with the guys that, you know, kind of got him there and they've traveled with him from Eastern Illinois to, to Bowling Green to Syracuse. So this season seems like, I'm not going to say completely six and six or bust, but I think if, you, if Syracuse can't win six games this year, you're going to see a lot of fans express a ton of frustration um, to only have, you know, one bowl season in, uh, in, in what would be five, five years. So you answered my next question, which was going to be, yeah, what does success look like this year? Get to postseason play, six wins, um, and that seems pretty reasonable. What does success look like overall at Syracuse? What is reasonable success? Uh, I've always said that, you know, making a bowl four out of every five years, winning and uh, jumping up and winning, you know, eight or nine once every five or six seems pretty reasonable. Like Syracuse has some unique challenges. Obviously we're for, far away from the rest of the conference, increased travel costs, don't have a local talent hotbed, private school. So don't have the same like kind of state recruiting ability that others have. Um, but you know what, like Dino's a great coach and it's obviously upgraded the talent level that we have uh, in place. I think if you, I think realistically you should be able to win six games though, if you schedule well and, and, and if you, you know, smartly kind of look at, how you maximize wins in non-conference play so that it takes some of the pressure off, at least in ACC play for those seasons where, you know, you might be rebuilding a little, but if you schedule four wins in non-conference play, you can still make a bowl as a rebuilding team. Or you could have the ACC restructure its division format and you could jump it. in there with Pitt, Duke, and the rest of them and take your turn at winning the Coastal. Perfect. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Got John Casillo on the line from uh, SB Nation's Noons Magician. Please uh, jump on over there. Check out Syracuse Athletics. Of course, football is front and center and headed our way for 2020 as we break down rosters across the nation. John, we appreciate you stopping by. Of course, Mark.